Hi! In this video I would like to demonstrate an open source tool that we've open sourced at Raza called What Lies. The goal of the tool is to help you understand what lies in word embeddings. In this video I would like to demonstrate what this tool can do for you and why we're reasonably excited about it. So let's say you've got a few word embeddings. A word embedding in essence is nothing more than a numeric vector that has a word attached. So let's pretend that this is the vector for dog. And this is the vector for cat. Because these word embeddings represent vectors, we can perform all sorts of mathematical operations on them. So let's say that I want to know what the vector dog plus the vector cat's like. You'd get somewhere over here. And what happens if you want to take the vector of cat minus the vector of dog? Well, then you get somewhere over here. But there are also some other operations that you can think of. For example, maybe you want to take the vector of dog and project that onto the vector of cat. Doing that will give you this vector. A projection, in this case of the vector dog onto the vector cat, aligns the vector of dog in the same direction as the vector of cat and can be used to compare the two. And in math you could say, well that's just the vector of dog projected onto the vector of cat. And if you can project onto a vector, you can also project away from it. The idea is that we're interested in having 90 degrees of an angle and then seeing how much of that is covered by our dog vector. Now you could say that we want to have the vector of dog but mate orthogonal to the vector of cat. There's a lot of these meaningful operations that you can do, and what lies will help you do these. So what I will briefly now do is make a few made up word embeddings and do these operations on them and visualize them as well. The first visualizations that I'll show involve matplotlib, so I'll make sure that that's imported. And next what I'll do is I will create a few embeddings, and these will be made up. An embedding object is little more than just text that is associated to a numeric vector, and this is how you can initialize them. Note that there's also a representation for this. But what I can also do is I can come up with perhaps interesting operations on these. I can add man and woman together. I can make man orthogonal, and what I can also do is I can do things like, you know what, give me man, but make that orthogonal to queen minus king. This is an embedding object, and what I can always do is check what vector now belongs to it. These numbers are great, but where our library really shines is in the visualizations. So I'll make a very quick one with matplotlib. What I'll do is I'll make sure that the figure size is a nice square, and I will make a plot of all of the embeddings that are listed above. I'll also turn the axes off. Next up what I can do is I can make new embeddings and have them appear in the plot. And the new embeddings that I'm creating in this case are queen minus king. So that should be this connection. And then I will have another one where I'll say, hey, but now take the vector for man and make that orthogonal. And that's what you see here. Man is being projected directly away. But there is something interesting about projecting all of these embeddings. Let's consider one example. So let's say that this is the vector for man, and that this is the vector for woman. Now let's suppose that I have this one extra vector, king. Doing visualizations with this is pretty tricky, because all of these vectors are in very high dimensions. But because we can apply projections, there's actually a trick that we can do now. What I can do is I can project king onto the vector of woman. And when we project the vector of king to the vector of woman, one thing that we can do is we can quantify how big the vector of king encompasses the vector of woman. We can calculate what percentage we've got covered here. And we can do a very similar thing with this vector for man too. So now we can apply a trick. We could, for example, say, hey, this measure here, let's plot that on the x-axis. And hey, the measure that we see here, let's put that on the y-axis. And we start thinking about vectors this way, then plotting high dimensional vectors on a two dimensional plane suddenly becomes possible. So let's show how you can do that in code. To properly do this in code, what I'll first do is import the spacey library. 
Spacey comes built in with vectors that I can use in my embeddings here. While that's loading, I'll just write a bunch of words down that I would like to see plotted. And we have a bunch of them. And next what I will do is I'll create a dictionary of these embedding objects. Now let's say that I would like to see man on the x-axis and woman on the y-axis. Well, then I can grab those two embeddings and I can then loop over all the tokens that I have. And now note, what I'm doing is I am not plotting arrows, but I'm using the plot method that is on the embedding. And what I can do is I can specify that there's an x-axis as well as a y-axis. Note that these are both embeddings. And what I'm also doing is I'm plotting the text along with it. And when I run this, I'm able to see a visual that helps me understand these word embeddings. This is nice, but we can go a step further. Having a dictionary that deals with all these embeddings, that's kind of tricky. And also, we might be able to do something that is quite interactive as well. And that's why in What Lies, we have a notion of an embedding set, as well as a notion of a language backend. And if you want to create a set of embeddings, then this is a way of doing it, but there's a more useful way too. So what I will now do is I will refer to the spacey language backend that we have in What Lies. This way I don't have to call spacey directly and things are just a little bit more performant. What I can then do is I can create a new language. And to start a language object from the spacey language, I just have to pass it the model that I would like to use from spacey. Now this is a language backend. And if I want to turn that into a set of embeddings, what I have to do is I have to say, hey, language, please give me the words that I'm interested in. And again, the word list that I have here, that's the same one that I've made here. Now note the subtle difference. An embedding set is a set of embeddings and I can directly perform computations on it. A language object is more like a lazy collection. Given this embedding set though, life is just a little bit easier. Because what I could just go ahead and do now is I can just type embedding.plotinteractive and then I can specify the axes. Now the nice thing about this plot is for starters, it's less work. I can just code this up directly, but this is an Altair visualization. So that means that I can zoom in and out, but I can also export it. This visualization can be hosted on a website. And if you look at the documentation page, you'll see plenty of these examples that are fully interactive. What I'll now do is I'll make a very similar plot, but just with different words. So one thing that's nice about this way of visualization is that you can very easily zoom in and out, but also that you can look for potential clusters that appear in your data set. You might wonder though, man, woman, are those the ideal axes at my disposal? Maybe I want to perform proper transformations on these things first. That is totally possible. In what lies, we've added a couple of transformations. And what I'll do for now is I'll just import PCA and UMAP. PCA and UMAP, by the way, are dimensionality reduction techniques. Under the hood, this library is using scikit-learn and UMAP-learn for both of these implementations. What I can now do is I can take the embedding that I have and then pass that through a pipeline step. So I could say, for example, before you plot it, please just add a principal component analysis and then change the underlying vectors. That means that the vectors that I have here will be different than the vectors that I have here. But the output will still be a embedding set. Another thing that's interesting is that these transformations also have some side effects. Note that we never changed the original embedding, but this new embedding will have smaller vectors because of the principal components. The new set will also have two new embeddings added, one for each principal component. And that means that I can visualize along that as an axis. This definitely seems interesting to me. We have two principal components, and what I can see is that there's definitely this one cluster, a cluster of royalty. So let's go one step further. What I can do is I can increase the number of principal components. And this plot remains the same, but that's because I'm only looking at two of these principal components. I might want to look at more. For that, we have the plot interactive matrix command. When you run this, and I'm going to have to zoom out a bit, you get a full matrix at your disposal. And you can also, from looking at this, 
get a bit of an impression of what the different components capture. This component seems to really capture the royalty thing here that's different. And if I look over here, it seems that this principal component captures something of family on one end. And then we got family prints here. And then colors on the other. Being able to play with these word embeddings will help with the understanding of it. But there are some other tricks too. I'll zoom back in again. So let's play a bit more of these transformations. One thing that I can do is I can say, hey, uh, let's transform the same embedding in two different ways. And then let's look at how these things are different in terms of clustering. The nice thing about Altair is that you can chain plots together. So by using the pipe operator here, you can have two plots appear in one cell. And you can see that both the PCA as well as the UMAP, and they kind of cluster this royalty thing a bit differently from the rest. I also see how these different embeddings capture things differently. So let's do one more example and then wrap up. What I've done now is I've gotten two collections of words. One collection contains animals and things that you can eat, and the other collection contains verbs. What I'm curious to do now is to train a transformer on one of these two sets and then have the same transformer apply it to another set. We have a lot of transformers in our library and not all of them are stateful, but PCA and UMAP are stateful. So that means that we can save the state from a transformer to use it someplace else. So I'll do that here. The way the transformers work is the first time that they're used in the transformation step, that's when they will be trained. Every time that they're used afterwards, they will not be retrained, but instead they are going to be reused. And what I can now do is I can make an embedding set of both by merging the two I have above. And now I can plot both. Now, this visualization is nice, but I would like to have a color attached now as well. To do that, we first have to add a property. Now what add property does is it allows you to give a name of a property and then a function, and then these two will add a property to all the embeddings in the embedding set. So for example, I will add a property called group, and now I will define a function that accepts an embedding and outputs the group number. So in this case, just group one will be fine. And I'll do group two below as well. Now what I can do is I can also specify the color because what I can do is I can give it a property that is attached to these embedding sets. And one thing that you can more easily see here is that UMAP seems to learn on a group and it seems to prefer that stuff that's a little bit unfamiliar to move that to the outskirts. Now this obviously depends on the hyperparameters that we give it, but this is a nice pattern because it allows you to give different colors to different groups of words. And you can still zoom in and out. If you're interested in learning more, everything that we've discussed in this video and more can be found on the documentation page. You will see nice interactive visuals of stuff that you can create. There's a getting started guide that explains what embeddings are and how to create all the different charts. And we also have an in-depth API. And this API demonstrates not only source code and API descriptions, but it will also demonstrate how to actually use all of the methods that are available. This is a package that I intend on maintaining for a while. So if you're interested in this, please reach out on GitHub and let me know if you have any feature requests. I hope this is something that'll make you appreciate word embeddings just a bit more. And I also hope that this is something you'll play with.